Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, the story of how this tool came to be, how it's made, and why it's a much cooler tool than I originally thought it would be. I am incredibly excited. Now, before I get started, the reason I'm interested in this tool, well, truth is, I make it. Now, what's it for? Basically, drill and handle materials. Now, I just delivered the first order, and like I said, I make it. But the idea in its broadest outlines is not mine. So quickly, I'm going to show you how it works. Then I'm going to back up and start from the beginning of the story. Then, at the end of the video, I'll tell you some things that you can do with it. Spoiler alert, it does a lot of cool stuff beyond the obvious. Okay, so here goes. Knife material goes in here. Tighten up the jaws. Set it on the drill press. Use the holes in the tang, in essence, as a drill guide and bust out the matching holes in your handle material. So, back to the story for the day, how did we get here? So, here's how the saga started. A while back, the guys at Pops Knife Supply came to me and asked me to help them make a drilling vise. The way they explained it to me, the vise is intended for drilling irregular shaped handle scales like horn, uh, antler, bone, all that sort of thing. And they suggested partnering on the project, so I'd design and make the tool, and then they'd sell it. Anyway, I went back to Command Central, and I started tinkering around with some ideas. Now, the first thing that struck me as I was sort of looking at what was out there in the market um, was that in every tool I examined, the vice jaws or whatever part of the tool was securing the handle material was always made of steel. Now, that's obviously real strong, but to me, this seemed to raise the possibility of scoring or breaking or just generally wrecking your beautiful and often pretty expensive handle material. So the first thing I decided was that if it was going to be strong enough, I wanted some kind of non-marring material for the vice jaw that secured the horn. Ultimately, I settled on HDPE plastic, which is really just a favorite of mine. It's amazingly machinable, it's tough, and it's surprisingly rigid. So to me, if I could make it work, the non-marring aspect of this tool would just justify the thing right out of the gate. Now, another point was that some of the vices in this general space use tools like Allen wrenches to adjust the jaws. Some adjusted from the bottom. Um, and, you know, none of this seemed ideal to the guys from Pops. So, in line with their thinking, I came up with a no tools top adjusting model. And here was the result. Worked out all the tooling and tool paths in Fusion 360, then ran a few through my Haas CNC machine. After the usual screw-ups, I had something that seemed to work. So FedExed it over to Pops and let him use it for a while. So the word came back pretty quickly. Love it, except it's just too small. The height of the jaws wasn't big enough to allow honking big pieces of antler or multiple pieces of micarta, and the jaws weren't wide enough for really big pieces of, well, anything. Also, Joey liked the idea of using three-quarter inch wide stock instead of the half inch that I'd originally used. The point he made, and I couldn't really argue with it, was that if you went to stand up half inch material on a drill press table, it's really easy to knock over, and that extra little quarter inch would make it more stable. Okay, fair enough. Back to the old drawing board. Quick note, if you've been watching the channel for some decent chunk of the 15 years I've been given free tips, here on YouTube, and you want to give back to the channel, there's a way. It's called Patreon. Join, help out at any pledge level, and get access to the plans that I've stacked up for years and years of projects, plus the good feeling of helping out the channel. Patreon.com slash Walter Sorrells. Increasing the height of the jaw opening was pretty trivial, but coming up with the side-to-side -side space was a much bigger issue. Obviously, you could just make it bigger, but the problem here is that we had a price point in mind. These days, aluminum has gotten crazy expensive, all metals have, and I was using 3-inch wide stock for the original design. 
I really wasn't wild about going to four inch stock to get the width, especially now that I was presumably gonna be going to three quarter inch thick stock too. All that extra aluminum would nearly double my material cost. The problem here is that in order to adjust the tool from the top, I had to leave room not only for the screw shanks, but for their heads, all of which resulted in a lot of wasted space that constrained the size material that the vise could accommodate. So I did a little cogitating and realized that if I thinned the side members a hair and then I bored a cavity into each side, essentially nesting that screw in the sidewall, I could buy myself nearly half an inch more space, which is huge. It meant changing the shape of the bottom jaw, but that didn't seem like it would be a problem, and as it turned out, it wasn't. Another round of debugging and deburring and cussing at the CNC machine. Send it off to Pops again. Love it, love it, love it, except maybe the wing nuts could be replaced with knobs. Now, I had started my earliest designs with the idea that I was gonna use knobs, but then I priced knobs, you know, brass knobs and knurled steel and all these things, and they were just really expensive. So I'd kind of forgotten about the whole knob idea, honestly. So anyway, Alan at Pops tracked down some more reasonably priced uh, knobs that, you know, look durable enough to make the tool work correctly, and there we are at the final design. So I finally had the high sign from Pops, and I finally set out to actually produce the thing for real. As always happens with this sort of thing, it took way longer than I expected. Weirdly enough, the biggest production bottleneck was actually not the CNC machine, which screened through the parts once I got all the kinks worked out. The thing that really held me up was cutting up hundreds of pieces of aluminum. I mostly used my bandsaw, which kept binding and stalling out, it was just a big pain. Anyway, the next question was how to finish the aluminum parts. You could waste a lot of time and drive up the price by finishing them like they were jewelry or something. Ceracoding them, whatever. But again, we're aiming for a functional tool at a reasonable price. So I went through about five different approaches, wet tumbling, dry tumbling, abrasive blasting, some other things, and finally settled on an approach that I like. But the first run includes a whole bunch of the results of that, a whole bunch of different approaches to finishing. In the future, I'll do them all exactly the same, but for now, there's a variety of them out there. I also had to come up with a plan for grinding the heads off the quarter 20 bolts so they'd fit into this slot of the bottom jaw. I considered using hex bolts in my original design, but I decided against them ultimately because I was pretty sure they'd strip out the pockets they nested in. So I had to come up with this somewhat complicated solution. It'd be nice if there were some kind of off-the-shelf bolt like this, but there's just not. At least I couldn't find one. After that, assembly. So these little plastic jaws just snap in here. And then the bolts are tapped into a slot in the bottom, so they have to go through these little holes here. And then the little knobs are threaded on. And finally the little rods are slipped through. Anyway, I know this is my little creation and look, we're all prone to falling in love with stuff we make, but I tell you, now that I've you know, actually got it in my hands, I just keep seeing new stuff that you can do with it. So this thing is just way better and way more useful than I really had even imagined when I got started with it. Even if you're not drilling stag or antler, horn or bone or whatever, and let me tell you, I drill that kind of stuff about once a decade, I really think this is gonna have a ton of uses even beyond that. I'm just psyched to work with it and start, you know, finding new stuff I can do with it. In fact, if you can think of something cool to do with it, leave a comment below. Even better yet, go to the Pops website, pick one up, link in the description by the way, and then report back about what you like or for that matter, what you don't like about it. So in the next few weeks, I'm gonna really take this thing out on a shakeout cruise. I got a lot of ideas about what I think you could do with it. Um, but once I've got a good sense of some tips and tricks and typical uses, 
I'll shoot out a video and show you everything I've learned. All right, guys, thanks for watching and keep on making those knives. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com